Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. What I want to do in this video is talk about all of the extreme weather events around the world and basically relate them to climate change. We're undergoing abrupt climate system change and it's having tremendous ramifications to, to our planet, to societies, to all the plants and animals on our planet and to us. Now, before I get into this, I just want to show you, I've got a, a visitor here. And uh, of course, this is Shackleton the Explorer. And he's a very conflicted cat at times. So he's uh, purring like crazy and wagging his tail at the same time. And, uh, but you know, he, he's uh, quite happy being here. He's uh, digging his claws into me occasionally. Oh, hey Shackleton. So I missed this guy on my trip, on my cross Canada trip. Um, you know, I was gone for uh, two weeks and uh, it was interesting. Um, you know, I visited many, many different cities and in most cities that I went to, um, checked out the city hall you know, which is usually located in the downtown area uh, of these cities. But uh, yeah, it was a good trip. This guy is extremely hot. We're in another bit of a heat wave here in Ottawa, where I am. So I was just on, excuse me, I was just on CTV News, okay, which is a Canadian news station. I was on at about 8.05 p.m. tonight. And it's, uh, what is July 18th? And uh, they wanted me to talk about extreme weather and relate it to climate change. They said I'd have four to five minutes. And I don't know, maybe I had four to five minutes, but it seemed like I only had, you know, I, it seemed like I only covered a, a, just a, a fraction of what I wanted to say, you know, less than 5%. So I thought, well, I've done a bit of a prep. I took a few notes and stuff. You know, and uh, I thought, well, I'll give it to you here in, in this video. So, you know, if you, yeah, so you can Google, you know, CTV News, July 18th, you know, 8, 8, 8, 8 o'clock p.m. The anchor is Jennifer Burke, and you should be able to find the clip. And if I can, I asked them to send a link to me. So that I can, if I if I get the link, I'll post it as a comment on this video. But you know what what's going on with the climate? I mean, it seems like we've got climate breakdown, and extreme weather events are taking off, and all over the world, and there's enormous consequences. Um, so let me talk about the connections between these extreme weather events and the climate. So last month, temperatures reached very record high temperatures in lots of British Columbia, Canada. So in the town of Lytton, BC, it basically sprang to international prominence because it set a Canadian record temperature on Monday. On Tuesday, it broke that temperature. On uh, Wednesday, it broke that temperature, setting a new Canadian record, almost 50 degrees Celsius. You know, it was like 49.6 degrees Celsius. You know, 50 Celsius multiplied by 9, divided by 5, add 32. It's 122 degrees Fahrenheit, if my math is correct. So... This is extremely worrying to a lot of mainstream climate scientists because the model said that this would be impossible for Canada. You might expect that temperature in the in the in Death Valley in the US or, you know, in the Middle East, but in Canada, you know, in a place where there's trees and vegetation and lots of houses and so on, I mean, you just don't expect it you know, in, in, in Canada. I mean, that's incredible. So what's really going on? So there's two main factors that I want to emphasize, and you've heard these things over and over from me, you know, if you followed my work 
over the last number of years. So the first main factor is that the air, the atmosphere can hold 7% more water vapor every time the temperature rises one degree Celsius. So if you look at our temperature, global average temperature now compared to the 1880 to 1910 average, so about the year 1900 temperatures, we're, that's the baseline for that 1.2. If you want to go back further to 1750, which was the original pre-industrial baseline, you need to add 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. So we're 1.4 to 1.5 degrees Celsius above, <coughs> above the original pre-industrial, but now lots of people call the pre-industrial the 1900 temperature. So just keep that in mind because the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their two degree guard ban or 1.5 degrees, those were originally um, based on the 1750 baseline. But they've just forgotten that. They want to shave off 0.3, so to call it 1900. Anyway, just keep aware of that. But the air can hold 7% more water vapor per degree Celsius. So we've got a lot more water vapor in the air. So why does that matter? Well, water vapor is an invisible gas, right? You know, when we talk about humidity, you know, it's the water vapor that's in the air that, that uh, prevents us from sweating as much. So our core body temperature heats up. So, you know, it's a combination of the temperature and the humidity that, it, it, that affects people, right? And, you know, most, you're, you're aware of that, I'm sure. So when there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, that water vapor, when you get convective heating at the Earth's surface, so the surface of the Earth heats from the sun on it, it heats the air above it, that air rises because hot air is less dense than cold air. So the hot air rises up and that carries the water vapor with it, of course. And then the temperature decreases as you go up, decreases with elevation or altitude. And eventually it reaches a point where that water vapor condenses. It needs particles to condense on or aerosols, but it condenses into droplets and it releases the energy of latent heat. And that release of the energy fuels the atmosphere, it supercharges the atmosphere. So we're getting these incredibly powerful long duration storms going on. Okay, so that's the first factor that the air can hold more water vapor, you know, a warmer atmosphere, a warmer earth can have much, much larger supercharged, if you like, storms. The second key factor is that the jet streams, which guide storms and separate cold, dry air in the Arctic, say, from warm, humid air further south, you know, acting as a wall separating those air masses, it's slowing, it's slowed down, and it's become wavier in the north-south direction, okay? Strong ridges, deep troughs, okay? So it's wavier, and it's more persistent. It gets stuck in place. So instead of, you know, it's stuck, it'll get like this, and it'll just stick there, and we get persistent weather or what blocking is what the weather people call it okay so it's slowing now one way this is crucial to storms is that the storms are guided and moved by the jet stream motion so the jet stream slowing down means that the storms are moving slower so they spend more period of time over certain regions and less period of time over other regions because they're not moving as fast so the areas where they, where they spend, you know, the storm is spending most of its time gets torrential rains that fills up the watershed and the rivers and cause, causes tremendous river flooding. Just look at what's happened in Germany, okay? Incredible flooding from the river, just from the rain events. And the streets in towns along the river just basically became part of the river. And then when the water receded, you look at the region and it's like total catastrophe. Okay, uh, you know, cars overturned, debris filling up, you know, many, many meters of, of debris in what used to be city streets. And, you know, buildings and water do not mix, okay? The water gets into the foundations and it weakens them. This has happened off the 
Florida coast, right, with the rising sea level and the increased storm surges on the coast of Florida. And because of its, its, it's built on limestone, the limestone acts like Swiss cheese and gets perforated and starts sinking down. And we got the collapse of the condo. So sea level rise in Florida, it's not going to be, well, it's just, it's just an inconvenience. You know, you can't go out of your building because occasionally water's in the streets around your building. If you're near the coastline, the buildings start collapsing. Okay, so we've, we've just seen this happen. So why is the jet stream slowing down? Okay, because the temperature heating on the planet is very uneven. We're getting far more heating the higher, the closer you go to the pole, whether it be the North Pole in the Arctic or the South Pole in Antarctica. The reason is, is that in Arctic, this heating melts the snow and ice, exposing darker surfaces. Those darker sur surfaces absorb more sunlight and therefore the Arctic is heating. And it's heating at three, four, five times the global average rate. The jet streams depend on the temperature difference between the Arctic and lower latitudes to exist. With no temperature difference, there'd be not a jet stream, significant jet stream. There might be one from the humidity difference between those two latitudes. But anyway, the jet stream, so as that temperature difference is decreasing because the Arctic's warming much faster than the lower latitudes, you get a slowing and a wavier jet stream. Okay, so we got this persistent jet stream, very powerful ridge over West North America, and then a trough, and then another ridge, and then another trough. And that other trough is in Europe. Okay, actually the jet stream split. Part of it went north, part of it went south, and it left a cold, left a trough, a, a cold area of uh, cold, cooler area with very, very unsettled weather and tremendous numbers of storms that weren't moving, that were fixed in place. These dropped torrential amounts of rain, which went into the European watershed and flooded out Germany. The, the town, many towns along these rivers in Germany just completely flooded, huge current flows. You know, water flowing is extremely powerful. You know, water is a very dense material. Next time you're at the beach, just try running through the water. The water wants to slow you down. It wants to stop you. It makes you really tired very quickly. Okay, so, you know, water has tremendous force. It's the best way to generate renewable energy if you have flowing water. Okay, so, so that was the, that was in the trough. And that's directly create, related to the ridge. It's the same jet stream. We've got these weather extremes going on in different places. They're directly connected by a climate change, changing the nature of the jet streams. And they're, the weather events, the weather extremities, the massive extremes of the weather incidents are directly connected. The flooding in Germany and Europe, and it's not just in Germany, Okay, it's also in Belgium, it's also in the Netherlands, um, it's also in part of the, the Czech uh, regions that some, along some of the borders. Tremendous extreme weather events, unsettling, and it's all tied to that jet stream. Now, so we're getting weather weirding. This is a term, I've come up with all of these terms and now, you know, people have, have, have taken the terms, which is fine. I maybe should have patented some of these things, like what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. You know, that's, that's my, my saying that has got the most traction over the years. Uh, weather weirding, weather wilding, weather whiplashing, those are all my terms. I was trying, sat down one day and just tried to think of how many, you know, weather, I need to think of W words that signify what's, what's happening. And, uh, you know, Ottawa, we just had a series of about four or five or six tornadoes in Ontario. Um, you know, again, um, it's very from, from very, very unsettled weather. I'm running out of time for this video. I like to keep my videos to 15 minutes, but I'm going to continue uh, with another video because I want to talk about 
Stuart Scott a bit as well. Thanks for listening.